Hello everyone and welcome back to the fourth episode on how to create your very own programming language. So in the first three episodes we added simple expressions to our language and I uploaded a bonus video which added the power operator to the language so if you haven't seen that I will leave a link in the description below. So in this episode we're going to be implementing variables. So the first thing we have to do is take a look at how variables are going to work. To assign a variable we're going to use the var keyword followed by the variable name, equals, and then the variable value. To access the variable, we will simply type in the variable name, and so then we can use that variable in more complicated expressions. So the first step to adding variables is to update the lexer. We are going to have to add three new token types to the lexer. Identifier, keyword, and equals. So an equals token will be the equal symbol, the identifier token will be any variable name, so the variable name can contain lowercase and uppercase letters, digits and underscores. And then a keyword will be the same thing as an identifier, the only difference is that the value is a name that's built into the language such as the var keyword. Okay, so if we come down to the tokens we can now add them, so we will begin with the identifier, then we have keyword, and finally we have equals. So if we come down to the make tokens method in the lexer, we will begin with adding the equals and that's identical to all the other symbols. We will just replace this with equals and then change the token type to equals. Next, we have to check if the current character is a letter and if that's the case, then we know it's going to be either an identifier or a keyword. So we're going to check if it's in this letters constant and we will define that later on. So then we can just append a new token and we can call self.makeIdentifier. So we now need to add this letters constant, so we're going to import string and we will set letters to string.ascii letters and that is just a list of all the letters from A to Z. We are also going to need a letters digits constant and that's going to be letters plus digits and you'll see why we'll need that in a second. So we'll now add in the make identifier method. So we need to keep track of the identifier as a string and we are also going to save the position start so we can use it at the end of the function. So similar to the make number method we need to check while the current character is not none and while the current character is in letters or digits. And if we want we can also allow underscores. So if that's the case we will then add that character to the id string and we can then advance. So after this loop we have built up the ID string, so now we need to determine whether we want to create an identifier token or a keyword token. So in a moment we are going to create a keywords constant and that's going to hold a list of all the different keywords that we will have in our language. So we will set the token type to keyword only if the ID string is in one of the keywords, otherwise it's going to be an identifier. So we can return a new token with that token type the id string as the value and then we can pass in the position start and our current position as the position end. So if we come back up to the tokens we will add in a keywords constant so that will be all the different keywords we will have in our language and at the moment we only have the var keyword. So if we run the program now and we put in an equals symbol as you can see the parser is complaining with an invalid syntax error. So this means it's gotten past the lexer and therefore our lexer code should be working fine. If the lexer code wasn't working then we would see an illegal character error. The same should apply now if we add in an identifier. Ok so the next step requires updating the parser and that means we have to change the grammar rules of our language. So this is going to be simple enough, all we have to do is update the expression rule. So if we have a variable assignment of a which is equal to 5 multiplied by 5, we want the 5 multiplied by 5 to take priority, so we want it to be as if there is parentheses around the right hand side, whereas we don't want the parentheses to be around the equals like that. Of course that wouldn't make much sense. So to make sure the variables aren't processed like this, the variable assignment is going to have to take the least priority out of all our expression rules currently. So from before I've put all the rules with the least priority nearer to the top. So that means since expression is a rule which takes the least priority, then that is the rule we have to update. So we'll add in a new rule for the expression. So the first thing we want to do is look for a keyword with the value of var. Then we want any identifier for the variable name and then an equal symbol, followed by a brand new expression and that expression is going to be the value of the variable. 
So all we have to do now is update that rule in our code and add a few new node types. So if we take a look at the expression method inside the parser, at the moment we are only looking for the binary operation. So what we have to do is add in this other rule and we can figure out which rule we should be looking for by checking if the current token is a var keyword or not. So if it is a var keyword then we know to look for this rule but otherwise we can look for this rule as before. So we are going to add in that check so if the current token matches the token type of keyword and the value of var. And the matches method is just a new method I've added to the token class which checks if the token matches the given type and value. So if that's the case we can look for our new rule but otherwise it will just go ahead and return the old rule. So we now need to add in a new parse result for this new rule. So now we can advance to the next token and we can wrap that in result.register. So after the var keyword we now have to look for an identifier which is the variable name. So first we have to check if the current token type is not equal to an identifier. And if that's the case we can create a failure. So we want an invalid syntax error. We'll pass in our current token positions. And for the error message we can just put in expected identifier. But if it is an identifier we can assign var name to that token. So we'll advance to the next token. And next we want to look for the equals token type. So if the current token is not equal to equals, again we need to create a failure. Passing in the error position and expected equals as the error message. But if it is an equals we can again advance. And next we have to look for a brand new expression. So we'll assign expression to a new expression wrapped in result.register. So if there is an error we have to return, but otherwise we can return result.success and we will return a new node that we'll be creating in a minute and that's going to be called the var assign node. So this node is going to take in a variable name and then an expression and that expression is the value of the variable. So we need to make one more small change to the grammar and then we can add in the new nodes. So currently in our language we can type in an integer or a float but we want to change this now so we can type in an identifier. So this identifier will be a variable name and when you type in a variable name it will get the value of that variable and use it in the expression. So this means instead of doing something such as 5 plus 5 we can now use uh, variable names instead. Okay so that means we just have to update the atom rule. So all we have to do now is add in a check if the token type is equal to identifier. So then we can advance and now we can return a new node which we will be also creating in a minute and that will be the var access node. So this node will just take in the token for the variable name so we'll just pass that in. So now whenever it comes across an identifier it will return this new var access node. So if we scroll up to the nodes we can now add the two new nodes so the var sign node and the var access node. We'll begin with the var access node. So in the init method we can just take in the var name token and we'll assign that to self.varname token and like every other node we need to keep track of the position start and the position end. So the position start will just be the var name token's position start and the same for the position end. So next is the var assign node. So this will also need a var name token and then a node which will be the new value of the variable. So we'll assign var name token and then we'll assign the value node. And then again we need to assign the position start and the end position. So that's going to be our value node's end position. So if we run our program and we assign the variable a25, as you can see there's an error in our interpreter because we didn't define a visit var assign node method. So this means that all we have to do to finish adding variables is update the interpreter. So to update the interpreter we're going to have to add a new symbol table class. So the idea of the symbol table class is to keep track of all the variable names and their values. So we'll create a symbols dictionary. And not only is the symbol table going to keep track of its symbols but it's also going to keep track of a parent symbol table. 
So if you imagine once we have functions in our language, we will create a new symbol table whenever a function is called. So that symbol table will store all the variables that have been assigned inside that function. And once that function has completed, then its symbol table can be removed and all its symbols are no longer available. But also that function symbol table will have a parent uh, symbol table. And that will be the global symbol table, so that will have all the global variables in the code, so those can be accessed anywhere in the code. So this is why we need to keep track of the parent symbol table. So we're going to add in our first method, so that's going to be get. And this is going to get the value from a certain variable name. So we'll take in the variable name, and so we'll assign variable to self.symbols, and we'll call the get method. So this Python method takes in the key of the dictionary, so that will be the variable name. And then it also takes in a default value if it can't find that key in the dictionary, so we'll just pass in none. So what we want to do now is if the value is none, then we want to go to the parent symbol table and check its symbol tables for the value. So we'll check if the value is none, and we'll also check if we have a parent symbol table, because the global symbol table won't have any parent, because it will be the root symbol table. So if it does have a parent, we can just return self.parent.get and pass in the variable name. However, if it did manage to find a value, then we can just return that value. So we also need to add in a set method. So this will take in a variable name and a new value for it. So all we have to do is self.symbols and set the key name equal to value. And finally, we need a remove method. So this will just take in a variable name and it will delete that variable from the symbols. Okay, so now we need some way of accessing the symbol table from uh, within the interpreter so that we can add and retrieve variables. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to use the context class we had before and we're going to add a new symbol table property. So now we're going to scroll down to the interpreter and add in the new visit methods. So we'll start with the visit var access node and this is going to take in the same parameters as every other method, so the node and the context. And we are going to need a new runtime result as well. So what we can do is we can get the variable name we are trying to access from node.varNameToken.value. And then we can get the value of this variable by uh, calling context.symbolTable.get uh, and then passing the variable name. So in case the variable is not defined yet, we are going to check if there is no value. And then we can just return result.failure and pass in this runtime error which says that the variable name is not defined. But otherwise we can go ahead and return result.success and then pass in the value. So now we can move on to the visit var sign node method. And it will take in the same parameters as before. We'll just create a runtime result. And again we can get the variable name in the same way as before. So we can go uh, node.varNameToken.value So if you remember from before, uh, the var assign node has a value node property. So this is the node we want to assign the variable to. So that means we can get the variable value by calling self.visit and getting the node's value node. And we will have to wrap that in result.register. So as usual, when we call the visit, we need to check if there is an error and if there is, we need to return. But if there is no error, then what we can do is we can get the symbol table and then we can call set var name to value. It's actually that simple. So now we'll just return result.success and pass in the value. So we just need to come down to the run function now and create a global symbol table. So we're going to set global symbol table to a new symbol table. And for no reason really, let's uh, add a new null variable and we'll just set that to a number with the value of zero. So that means if you type in null, it's the same thing as typing in zero. So what we want to do is come down to the context we've created here and just set the symbol table equal to our global symbol table. Just before we run the program, I forgot to pass in the context variable when calling the visit method in uh, the visit var assign node method. So don't forget to add that in. So if we run the program now and we type in var a equals 5, and uh, now we type in a, we get a value of 5, and we can put that in more complicated expressions, and it all works perfectly. We can also assign multiple variables to the same value, so we can go var a equals var b equals var c equals 10, and now a, b, and c are all 10.
We can also use this built-in null variable which we've added, which is just equal to zero. And you can use var assignments in expressions. So what that will do is it will create a variable x, assign it to six, and add it to five. And we've got a result of 11, but the variable x is still equal to six. So before we finish off this video, we're going to do a tiny bit of code refactoring. And the main reason I'm doing this is because there is currently a situation where the wrong error message is shown, so we need to fix that. So the first thing we're going to do is update the register method inside the parse result. So at the moment we pass in a parse result to this register method, but we also call register when we advance. Now when we advance it doesn't return anything and so it's just passing in none into the register method. And so what we're going to do is we're going to separate the register method into two different methods. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our normal register method from before and we're going to get rid of this is instance check and we can get rid of this return statement as well. And so now the register method is only going to be for passing in parse results. So now we're going to create a separate register advancement method and this is going to be only for advancements. And we're just going to pass for now. So what we want to do now is wherever we call self.advance and then call result.register, we're going to change that to result.registeradvancement and then call self.advance afterwards and then remove this line. So what I'm going to do is use find and replace to do this for me and this should work for almost any text editor. I'm using Visual Studio Code. So if we press Control F or Command F and we uh, open up find and replace, so if you make sure this regex option here is selected, then you can type the following in. So result.register self.advance and then put a backslash before each parenthesis. And then you can replace it with result.register advancement and then a new line backslash n and then self.advance. So if we go through and replace all those, the only thing you have to do now is go through them and indent them. So what we have to do now is update our error messages slightly. So inside the atom method, uh, we are now checking for identifiers, so we need to include that in the error message as well. So the next thing we have to fix is if we put in some invalid syntax, we need to update this error message to tell us that we can put in the var statement. So you might assume that we should put this inside the atom error message, but that's actually not the case. In this situation, it works perfectly. But if we put in, for example, 5 plus var a equals 5, this expression fails unless we put var a equals 5 in parentheses. But as you can see, it is complaining about the var uh, keyword, yet in the error message, it's telling us we can put var in. So that's obviously incorrect. So what we need to do is remove var from this error message. And what we want to do is only add in this var error message when we are inside the expression, because that's where we're looking for it. So the first thing we are going to do is move this binary operation into a variable and we'll call that node and we need to wrap this in result.register. So in order to make it behave in the same way as before, we need to check for an error and then return, but otherwise return result.success. So what we're going to do is when there's an error, instead of just returning result, we're actually going to return result.failure and pass in this new error message which includes the var keyword. So what this code ends up doing is overwriting any error message that comes from the term method. So if we type in multiply, it overrides that error message and we now have the var keyword. But we are still back to the problem before because if we type in 5 plus var a equals 5, it's still overwriting the error message with the var keyword in it. So we need some way of figuring out when and when not to overwrite this message. So if we take a look at this quick example, when we type in an expression, if we type in something invalid, such as a multiply symbol, it should say expected var plus minus, etc, etc. But if the first part of the expression is valid, and then we move on, then any further error message should not contain the var keyword, so it should not be overwritten. So what this means is that we should only override the error message inside the expression method if there are no advancements since, i.e we are still at the very first part of the expression. So what we want to do is modify the parse result to only assign the error if there is currently no error message, or we should override. And whether we should override or not is if we haven't advanced since. 
So what we're going to do is add in a new advance count to the parse result. So this is just going to be a number that keeps track of how many times we have advanced in this specific function which has this parse result. So when we register an advancement, we can then increase the advance count by 1. And when we register another parse result, we can just increment our advance count uh, by the other parse result's advance count. So now the way we check if we haven't advanced since is by just checking if self.advance count is equal to 0. So if we run the program and we put in some invalid syntax, as you can see var is included in the error message because it got overwritten. But if it is no longer the first token of uh, the expression, then the error message doesn't get overwritten and therefore the var keyword is not included. So everything's working as intended. So there's one more thing we will quickly fix in this video and it will only take two seconds. So if we create var a equals zero and then we create a runtime error, so the only runtime error we have at the moment is division by zero. So if we do 10 divided by a and we hit enter, when it complains with the division by zero error, it's actually pointing to the variable assignment to zero. So instead of pointing to where the division by zero error occurred, it's actually pointing to where in the past we assigned to zero and we do not want that. So the reason this is the case is because in the var visit var access node method, when we get the variable from the symbol table, uh, when we get the value, it will just simply return that value and that value will have the position start and position end of where it was assigned. But what we want is that the positions are where it's accessed. So what we want to do is uh, reassign the value to a copy of the value and then we change the position to the var access node's position start and position end. And this means we do have to add in this new copy method. So if we run the program again, everything should be fixed. Okay everyone, so that's going to be it for this video. In the next episode, we are going to be adding in comparisons. And then in the episode after, we will be adding in the if statement, which will use those comparisons. So thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like. If you have any questions or issues, don't hesitate to leave a comment below. And I will see you next time.